I want to read out of Psalms 103. Psalm 103, beginning in verse 13. The writer writes the following. Psalm 103, verse 13, he says, Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. For He Himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. That last verse is the one I want to key in on tonight. So the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him, for He Himself knows our frame. God is mindful that we are but dust. I think these verses in, uh, in this particular psalm remind us of how weak we really are and you know, the physical limits that all of us have because of our sinful natures. Our sinful natures obviously weaken our nature. And the, the psalmist here is, is recognizing before God how weak we are, not just physically that we live for a while, a very short while, and then everyone dies, but weak, weak, morally weak, you know, ethically weak. It doesn't take much to knock us over. It doesn't take much to tangle us up in sin. It doesn't take much to seduce us or to lure us into all kinds of problems. We're, we're, we're very weak and he's calling out to God and, and saying, you know, that we're, you know that we're weak, right God? You, you know, I'm, I'm hoping you know this. Now what's more difficult to accept uh, in life um, are the spiritual limits that we have. The spiritual limits that God places on us in times. We're painfully aware, of course, of the physical limits, but sometimes the spiritual limits, you know, we, we think that uh, when it comes to, to, to spiritual things, you know, the sky's the limit. Just, you know, if you believe everything goes, you, know, you can do everything, just call on the Lord, boy, you can do all, all kinds of things. And we should try big things and do all kinds of things. But when we examine the word, and I like Marty, you know, I, I love this sermon this morning, you know, things that Jesus didn't say. And attitudes that, we, you know, that we, we give to the Bible that it doesn't really have. You know what I'm saying? I, my, my, my lesson kind of falls into this, to this, same, to this same idea. When we examine the word, we learn that we often have to accept not only physical limitations, but spiritual limitations as well. And that's a little more difficult to swallow. I'll give you some examples of that. Sometimes we're limited by the Holy Spirit. And a good example of that, of course, is in Acts chapter 16, verse six, where Luke writes that Paul and the others with him were prevented by the Holy Spirit to go preach the gospel in Asia. Now, if you kind of go back to the time, you know, uh, this period in history where Paul was you know, going out and preaching uh, uh, the gospel, especially to the Gentiles. He wanted to kind of go to new territory. And I mean, it, if, if we would have been there with his group, you know, it would have made all the sense in the world to go to Asia, to go to that part of the world. Asia had many lost souls. Asia was accessible. Um, Paul and his group were ready. They were able, they were willing to go. But the Holy Spirit limited his ministry from going there, sending him north and westward instead of eastward. You know, sometimes the Holy Spirit prevents or limits our lives as well. I mean, the Bible is you know, economic in its um, information, you know, one or two lines. It doesn't tell us how the Holy Spirit limited it. Who knows how? Maybe a bridge was washed out. Maybe they ran out of money. You know, maybe, you know, who, knows? who knows why they couldn't go? All we know is that somehow the Spirit prevented them from doing something they really wanted to do for God. Well, sometimes the Holy Spirit prevents or limits us as well. You know, we see a good thing. We see a needful thing. We have the desire, we have the ability, we have the willingness to do it, but somehow God does not provide the resources. God doesn't open the door. God doesn't give us an opportunity. 
or He permits us to be ill or something else that happens and, and we miss the chance, we miss the opportunity. I mean, I've experienced that in, in my life. I think of one thing in particular. Um, three times in my life uh, as a, a minister, I've been invited to go preach in Europe, in different places in, in Europe. Uh, one time was a, a retreat that they were organizing, I think it was in Paris, for many, many preachers of the church throughout Europe, a big convention, and they had invited me to go preach at that thing. Another time they were having a gospel meeting in Switzerland and I was invited to go and speak at that meeting. And then another time in Belgrade, they were doing a television thing, they wanted me to go preach there and teach a class, they were going to film it, and it was going to be on TV, on Belgrade TV, and so on and so forth. And every single time, something happened to prevent me from going. I mean, I wanted to go very badly. I spoke French, I was one of the few preachers you know, in the church, uh, in North America anyways, that, that was fluent in French and all these places needed somebody who spoke French. And uh, I had the money to go, I was ready, I was, but every time something prevented me, something serious prevented me from going and, and doing this work. And I remember praying, God, you know, why, why is this happening? Man, one time, okay, two times maybe, but three times. You know, God doesn't always give us reasons why He limits us spiritually. When this happens, you know, we need especially to accept His will and like Paul, continue to look for other ways and other opportunities to serve and not be, you know, not be dismayed, not be discouraged. You know, I, don't, I don't believe that God is against us when He limits us. I simply think that we're perhaps out of sync with His plan. We may be out of sync with His, with his purpose or His timing. You know, maybe, yeah, somebody needs to go there, but this is not the right time. Or maybe you're not ready. Maybe your, your time is not, you're not mature enough yet to do this particular thing. And so when this happens, it's wise to make you know, an extra effort to seek His will in prayer so that we can discern what it is He wants us to do. You know, we read, I go back to Acts 6, again, just a few lines explaining uh, Paul's dilemma, wanting to go here and being prevented. What it doesn't say, but what I am persuaded happened, was a lot of praying. I'm persuaded that Paul, you know, being you know, limited in, 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 in reaching out in that direction, must have prayed fervently to the Lord and saying, well, Lord, you know, you, you've sent me out to preach and I'm going out to preach and now, you know, whatever, I, we're limited. You're not allowing me to go. What do you want me to do? And it's funny, we read in the next verses, he gets a vision, the Macedonian call, and he, he goes completely in the other direction. So sometimes you know, we're limited by the Spirit of God to do the things that we want to do for God. And maybe what I'm trying to say is, that's okay, that's, that's not out of the ordinary, that's not the devil working. You know, God sometimes limits His servants in the service that they wish to do. Sometimes we are limited because of our knowledge. Paul, again, in speaking of spiritual gifts, says to those who have the gift of preaching and teaching, he says to them in Romans 12 verse 6 that they should do so to the limit of their faith. To the limit of their faith. Now some Bibles, depends on your version, says the proportion of your faith. In this context, Paul was not talking about faith in the sense of one's trust or confidence, you know, like I believe in Jesus, I trust that God will save me, you know, that kind of faith. He's not talking about that. He's talking about the faith, the faith, you know, that body of knowledge concerning the Christian religion, the faith. And he says many have the calling and many have the gift and many have the urge to preach and to teach, but not all have the same level of knowledge. Knowledge and understanding of the faith. We are limited 
by our knowledge of the word many times. Now this doesn't mean that we have to quit if we have limited knowledge, because if that was the case, we'd all have to quit, because all of us have you know, limited knowledge, right? It means simply to preach and teach what we know, what we're sure of. I remember one of my teachers in college saying, whatever you do, don't get up in the pulpit and tell people what you're not sure of. <laughs> Save that for yourself, save that for your prayer time, save that for your study time, save that for the times that you're going to be talking about that with an older brother, uh, one of the elders, you know, the things you're not quite sure of yet, because when you get into that pulpit, you need to be preaching the things that you're confident in, that you know something about, because people in the pew, they want to hear something that they don't know, or they want to understand something more clearly that they've only understood partially. And it's not very helpful for the preacher to get into the pulpit and preach about things he doesn't, he doesn't really know, and he's not confident about, and he's not sure about. Wonderful example of this is uh, many years ago, I was in uh, Florida. Lisa and I were on vacation in Florida, and as we do on vacation, we found a church and we went to visit a church for services there, and you know how it is, after church you talk and you visit with people that you don't know, and I was visiting with this older gentleman, he was in his 80s, and we were just chit-chatting about church and where you come from, and he had told me that he was a preacher, he was retired now, and he had been a preacher, and he had an interesting introduction to ministry, and I said, really? So he told me his story. He told me that when he was, a, he was converted when he was in his 60s, he became a Christian when he was in his 60s in this little congregation, and you know, the preacher had worked with him and taught him and so on and so forth, and he had been baptized, and it was only a couple of months after he had become a Christian, the preacher had to go out of town and said to him, okay, you're going to preach the sermon on Sunday. Again, a small congregation. So I want you to just come up with a lesson on Sunday, just do your best. And so he was kind of you know, nervous about it, and he was thinking, well, what am, I, you know, what am I going to say? What am I going to talk about? And so he remembered that when the preacher taught him, you know, when he was having a Bible study with the preacher of that congregation, the preacher had explained to him the gospel, of course, Jesus died for your sins, was buried, resurrected, you know, uh, uh, your, your salvation is based on your faith in Him, and the response of your faith should be you know, to hear the gospel and to confess Christ and to, uh, and, and to repent, to be baptized, so on and so forth, and he did that. So he said to me, I was thinking, well, one thing I really am sure of, I really am sure that you know, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and died for my sins, that, that I'm really sure of, and I'm really sure that the way to kind of respond to the gospel is to believe it and to confess in Christ and to confess my faith in Christ and to remit of my sins and to, to be baptized, so on and so forth. So he said, I went home, and this was before you know, iPads and stuff like that. I went home and I got you know, bristle board you know, that you used to use, and cardboard you, know, you used to use in class, white cardboard and a marker. And I wrote at the top, you know, the uh, you know, response of faith, you know, response of faith unto salvation. And I put number one, you know, must hear the gospel. You know, and then I took a second card and I put number one, must hear the gospel. Number two, you know, must confess my faith in Christ. You know, and then third card, number three, you know, must repent of my sin. You know what I'm saying? He put down the four or five things. So he got up on the Sunday and, and, and said, well, brother so-and-so is gone. And, and I'm here to preach, and, and here's my lesson. You know, how should we respond to the gospel? And he took a few moments to explain the gospel, the death, burial, and, of, of, and resurrection of Jesus, so on and so on. And then he got his little easel out with his pointer, you know, old style, and he says, well, number one, and he went through number one. Then he took the card down and he said, then number two, and he took the card down and then said, number three, and he went three, four, five, and, and that was it, and if anybody needs to respond, come forward now, you know, 16 minute sermon. Five people came forward and were baptized. <laughs> Five people came forward and were baptized. And that experience energized him, oh! And, and the energy that he drew from that is the power of God's word. I mean, wow, if that can happen, 16 minutes, such simple things that everybody should know. Imagine if I really knew what was in this book. 
So he went to school. I, I, I forget now, one of the preaching schools, and you know, two years preaching school, mature students, so on and so forth. And then he came out and he preached for another 15, 15 years, a kind of a late career uh, in, his, in his life. So what does this have to do with what I'm talking Remember the, uh, one of the things they also taught us, make sure your example is not stronger than your point. You know? <laughs> Sometimes we're limited by our knowledge. The point of that story is that brother didn't know a lot. He didn't know Greek and he didn't know context and he didn't know this and he didn't know premillennial versus amillennial. He didn't know any of that stuff. The only thing he knew for sure that the Bible taught was how to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ and that's what he, that's what he taught. He taught to the limit of his faith. So some people think that they shouldn't teach or preach until they know as much as the elders know or the preachers know. And that's, that's unfortunate. Because in placing this limit you know, to preach according to our knowledge, Paul actually opens the door to everyone who has a calling to this kind of ministry. The calling is to practice it. However, he warns everyone from the most experienced to the novice to be careful not to go beyond not only what they know, but also they must not go beyond what they know to be true. Again, I refer back to Marty's sermon this morning. Not teaching what they think the Bible says, but to teach exactly what the Bible says. When we preach, we are limited not only by our knowledge of the word, but also by the word itself. Sometimes it's tempting to follow fads or popular ideas, but we always have to test these things against the scripture themselves. Good example is a couple of days ago, you know, um, I don't usually mention the Catholic Church, but the Catholic bishops had a meeting with uh, the new Pope, Pope Francis, and they were coming up with some position papers on different you know, moral issues. And when it came to the gay issue, apparently uh, Pope Francis uh, you know, spoke to all the bishops you know, and said, well, you know, we need to be more open. We need to let people know that uh, uh, gay people have a lot to offer to the church. We need to be more well welcoming. We need to recognize, he actually said, we need to recognize that although the church is against gay marriage, well, this may provide some form of moral or, or comfort for people who are in these things. This, this was what he was proposing. Well, the Catholic bishops, a conservative group, said, no way, no way. And they took that resolution and tore it apart and said, uh-uh. So it was amazing that they said, We're, you know, it is plain in the Bible that gay marriage is forbidden, that marriage is only for one man and one woman. And what was interesting that I found was that they said, even though the Pope is encouraging us to kind of become more lenient on this particular moral issue, the Bible is so clear on this subject that we cannot move away from it. And I said, way to go, guys. <laughs> now there are a few other issues I'd like to discuss with you, but I mean, you know, Let's face it, you know, the, the, the Roman, Roman Catholicism is the largest, quote, Christian, okay? It's the largest group in the United States. They have tremendous influence. And I was thankful that at least these bishops, these local guys who manage you know, churches in their area, had enough sense to understand that to open that door was to completely, you know, to completely lose all credibility. And they used the Bible as the reason for their conservative position. So we can always increase our knowledge and in so doing expand our preaching and our teaching, but we must always respect the limits of the word and not go beyond what it says. We must respect the boundaries of scriptures or as the, not the Catholics, but as the restorationists used to say, we do speak where the, the scriptures speak and we do remain silent when they are silent. That's easy to say, but it's not always, not always easy to do. Then another time, 
about our, our uh, limitations. Sometimes we simply have limited success. You know, no matter how hard we try, no matter how much experience and knowledge we have, sometimes our success is, is limited. Jeremiah, we always go to Jeremiah for this example, he preached for some 40 years and was largely rejected and ridiculed by his, uh, by his nation. But he's not the only one. Peter failed to persuade the Jews even though most of his ministry was in Jerusalem. Paul, the great epistle writer and apostle to the Gentiles, was laughed out of Athens, the heart of Greek thinking and philosophy. You know, in my own life, I had no brothers or sisters. Uh, my father was gone you know, long before I ever became a Christian. Only my mother was alive when I was converted. But she never wanted to study the Bible with me. And she refused to come to church with me even if I was the one who was doing the preaching. No, no way. You know, everyone at one time or another suffers limited success in spiritual matters. Sometimes we fail at evangelizing and, and, and teaching. Sometimes we fail at li as living as purely or as devotedly as we would like to. You know, we have limited success. Sometimes we fail at loving others the way Christ would have us love others. Sometimes we fail even at loving ourselves the way that we ought to love ourselves. Sometimes our limited success is due to our own weakness and sins, and sometimes our failures are caused by the hard hearts and the sinfulness of others. And other times God will, will not give us the victory we seek. There are some times, I can't tell you how many times that I prayed you know, for the church in Montreal, that, that it would grow, that it would just take off, you know, and oh, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. It, it, it was like you know, getting blood from a stone. You know, the hearts were so hardened over so many, over so many years. You know, my own, my own limited success in various areas and the discouragement that comes with them has taught me one important thing. And that is that you learn a whole lot more in the valley of failure than you do on the mountaintop of success. Because I've had both in my life. And I can tell you where the learning starts. It's usually at the bottom and not at the top. If it wasn't for limited success and failure in my life, I would never have searched for God. I thank Him every day that He allowed me to fail miserably in my professional life, in my personal life before I became a Christian so that I would at least have the sense to begin searching for Him. And so in our, in our society where everything is about success and everything is about being number one and everything is about you know, just being better or bigger or flashier than the next guy, God uses, uh, God uses failure. We need to understand that it's one of His tools that He uses to make us and to shape us. If it wasn't for my failures, I would have never truly understood and accepted grace. I would have never seen the power of God working in me. I would have never developed any compassion for others who have limited success and outright failure as well. Limited success is discouraging, it's frustrating, but don't ever see it as God abandoning or ignoring you. God is always with the saints, whether they are shouting from the mountaintop or struggling down in the valley. He is always, always with us. He is always, always working with us and working on us. So our spiritual lives are limited at times and we need to recognize this. Sometimes the Holy Spirit opens or closes doors of opportunity which restrict us. All of us are limited by our knowledge and by the natural boundaries placed on us by the scriptures. And many times we find our efforts not succeeding in the way we would like them to. But in all these instances where we are spiritually limited, let's remember that there is never any limits to God's love and God's mercy and God's power 
to save us, to raise us from the grave to a new life with Him in heaven. Because, brothers and sisters, there are times when we are limited, but God is never limited. Let's remember also that the amount of success or lack of success in our lives does not determine His love and His desire to preserve us for life everlasting. His love is freely given. His salvation is freely offered to all those who believe in Jesus Christ. I'll tell you something, the most successful person in the world is the one who believes and serves Jesus. That's the most successful person in the world. Not the, you know, the world's most handsome man or the world's most handsome or the Forbes list of the richest or the most famous and all the glossy magazines. No, no. The most successful person is that person who humbles himself or herself and says, you Jesus, you are God. I am the sinner, you are the savior, and I will humble myself before you in baptism, and I will devote myself to your service for all of my life. That person is the most successful person in the world. Don't be discouraged, brothers and sisters, and don't be proud of your rate of success. Be happy instead that God saves you through faith in Jesus Christ. And so if you'd like to experience and benefit from this success, I do like that old preacher says, I encourage you to come, confess your faith tonight, and repent of your sins, and be baptized for the forgiveness of those sins that you might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This will be the most successful thing that you will ever do in your life and forevermore. If you need to respond to the invitation tonight, the invitation to eternal success, then I encourage you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.